Um, well, thank you so much, Deanna, for that um, introduction. And I also want to thank Susan Cheel, who invited me to come here, and also Tracy Robertson, who has worked with me closely on the Vortman exhibition, and Victoria in the uh, gallery, who helped with the installation, and also uh, Johanna Cervantes, who showed me around the graduate uh, studios yesterday. Um, so before I talk about myself, my career, um, I wanted to just say a few things about the, the Vertman exhibition um, because it was really uh, a thrill and an honor to be able to be uh, the juror this year. The, the work was all around just terrific, really high quality, um, so everybody should be commended and just know that you're you're at a great school and you're doing great work and I was very impressed with the the level of everything that was submitted and it made my job really hard um, but uh, also want to just real specifically mention that I thought everybody's photography that they submitted was really good so kudos to you for that a plus on photography um, I'm going to give a B, though, on the exhibition ready factor because uh, uh, there were enough people who didn't have their work ready to hang. And so that affects you know, how your work is going to look in the end in the show. So be mindful of that. And I'll give you an A on photography, but a B on exhibition ready. Um, and then I'm sorry that I don't get a chance to see the whole exhibition um, installed because that's happening today and I have to leave right after this for the airport. Um, but I did want to congratulate everybody who got in the show and all of the award winners. And um, I know it's going to be beautiful when it's all finished. So um, Susan Cheel asked me to sort of summarize my career for you and I guess I could have subtitled the subtitle of my presentation, there are a wide range of careers to be had with um, an art history degree, which is what I have, I have a master's in art history from Cal State LA, um, and also um, you know, in, the, in the studio arts as well. So I know some parents, some of you have parents who are telling you, what are you going to do? What's going to happen to you? Um, how are you going to get paid? But there's, there's a lot of things you can do, and I'm going to tell you what my path was anyway, which is just one way. Um, so I wanted to start, though, with the very beginning for me, which was um, summarized here in the uh, Fort Worth Star-Telegram, -Tele 1967. This was an article on... Um, it says Artie family at the bottom. Um, so artist Ed Blackburn and his wife Linda Blackburn relax from their painting for a moment while their very precocious daughter Ra Rachel works diligently at her artwork. Both parents also teach. Um, so that's kind of how I grew up. My, my house was always filled with artists and musicians and poets and creative types, which was really great. Um, but when I got to college, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do beyond that, because it was literally kind of what I knew. Um, here's a, a, an image um, with me and my mother, Linda Blackburn, um, and her, her work hanging in between us, and that was at the Dallas Museum of Art. So I was kind of a little museum rat. <laughs> um, and this is a picture of, two pictures of Ed Blackburn, probably from about mid-70s or somewhere early 70s maybe, um, in his studio in Fort Worth, which he called the Main Street Image Company. And there's a little motto right above his head there on the left uh, that says, all the news that's fit to draw, which is probably still pretty applicable to his work today. And I hung out at his studio all the time when I was a kid, especially during the summers. And I learned a lot of things from just being in the studio. Um, he worked a lot from Life magazines and had stacks and stacks of back issues. And I went through those all summer long for many, many summers and learned a lot. Uh, this is a picture of Dad uh, with his first really major commission that he did for, I believe it was USA Art Insurance Company. So it was a huge painting, and this is actually just a part of it. It goes beyond the the slide there. And this um, is a, p a painting of his that is called Pop Post and it is in the collection of the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. 
And I wanted to show it specifically because my very first job in the museum field was as a security guard at the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth. And my mother actually said to me when I was, I had just started going to TCU, and I had really no idea how I was going to pay for it. And um, I had already, I admit, I have already flunked out at Texas Tech. I didn't really flunk out, I just quit. So I kind of um, was, I was not in a good place as far as school was going. Um, and I had also been here for a year and a half and I was just kind of floundering around and I landed at TCU. And she said to me, why don't you go apply for a job as a security guard at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth? And I said, okay. And I did and it was really an amazing thing because it, it started my whole career. So listen to your mothers, it's just a <laughs> word of wisdom. Um, but this painting is also important to me because as a security guard, I would be standing in the galleries when people came in, visitors came in and, and were looking around. And a lot of people were really um, perplexed by this painting because they thought it was a huge magazine. Um, and it's, it is a big picture. It's like, I don't know, at 90 inches high, maybe something like that. Um, but people would come up to it and want to look behind it and they just couldn't figure it out because it was uh, hyper realistic. So I got to sit there and listen to people talk about my father's painting and not know that I was his daughter and it was, it was kind of weird but, uh, but very interesting. Um, so I did spend um, 10 years at the Modern Art Museum after I was a security guard. I worked my way up to being uh, a receptionist answering the phone. I worked in the director's office. Um, I was the director's secretary when they used that word, secretary. Um, and then I was also in the registrar's office and I was there for 10 years and I really took advantage of everything that that institution could offer me. And I, I worked really hard and I asked for promotions and when I didn't get them, I worked for them and I asked for a promotion again and I was very, um, uh, headstrong about getting ahead and uh, it, I you know at that time maybe it was a little bit easier than it is now to work your way up in an institution but that's that's what I did um, from the modern in Fort Worth I went to the Iris and B. Gerald Cantor Foundation which is a private operating foundation based in Los Angeles and they um, own and manage the world's largest collection of Rodin sculpture Rodin being the 19th century French uh, sculptor who's really known for, best known for his sculpture called The Thinker. Um, and this is a picture of my office. I started there as a curator, um, working on traveling exhibitions of Rodin sculpture that the foundation circulated all around the country and internationally. And then after four years, I got the executive director's job, which again, I, I asked for and I, um, asked for again and I finally got it and earned it. Um, but uh, it was a really terrific job. I've got some pictures of the thinker here because uh, that's kind of what everybody knows and I didn't have a lot of other pictures of, of uh, the collection unfortunately but um, real briefly on the foundation, um, Mr. Cantor who started this foundation um, fell in love with Rodin bought a lot of his work and he his business was Cantor Fitzgerald which was a security trading company and initially um, they were headquartered in the World Trade Center in New York on the 105th floor and he took all of this massive bronze sculpture up to the 105th floor and made a museum up there to show it to the public um, and it was in the Guinness Book of World Record as the old, highest museum in the world. It's kind of an odd trivia fact, but kind of fun. Um, ultimately, that didn't work out because it was too hard to get up there and they didn't have a lot of traffic and they needed the, the space for their business anyway. So they started circulating these exhibitions because they had literally um, three or four hundred pieces. Um, so part of my job at the foundation was working on these exhibitions. Part of it was um, from a, uh, when I got the director's job, there was uh, other philanthropic activity that the foundation was doing, such as grant making. Um, and so 
that gave me the opportunity to learn a lot about business, which I wouldn't have normally learned had I not uh, been sort of brave enough to, to ask for that director's job. Um, so here's some other pictures of the thinker. Um, he was originally conceived to go on the gates of hell, Rodin's monumental bronze doors that were never actually cast in his lifetime, but here's a picture of where the thinker goes um, on the gates of hell. And um, you might know or you might not know that Rodin worked, um, he made what is called reductions and enlargements from his sculpture. And he did that for a couple of reasons, but the thinker that goes on the bronze doors of the gates of hell was 28 inches high, like about this. And he also uh, blew it up to this monumental scale, which I, I think is 79 inches, which is what you see over there. And there's about 12 of those bronze casts in the world, maybe 14 now. Um, and then he also reduced it in size so that he could sell it. And what, what really um, his idea was that if he could sell a lot of these small versions, like 14 inches, then he could finance his, his big ones. So he was also a, a pretty significant entrepreneur when it came to thinking about his work. Um, and I just threw these in because um, people would send us pictures of the thinker from all places and we had a file, I mean it was this thick as to um, various strange uses of, of the thinker because it was in the public domain. So everywhere from being a part of Google to cartoons and whatnot, the thinker is kind of ubiquitous. Um, so after eight years there at the Cantor Foundation, I um, wanted to return to the museum world. I had worked with uh, Rodin for eight years and I was tired of Rodin understandably and uh, wanted to, to go back to contemporary art and go back to working with living artists so I want I felt qualified at that point to be a museum director so I applied for some jobs and I knew I was going to have to move from Los Angeles to a smaller community in order to make that work and I was lucky enough to uh, be able to move to Kansas City for the a job at the Kemper Museum um, which I thought, well, okay, I'll go there. It's probably not going to be that great, but it's turned out to be a really terrific city, and I'm still there about 15 years later. Um, this is a picture of the outside of the building. It's a really gorgeous building designed by Gunnar Burkitz, and uh, it kind of looks like a bird from the top. It's got two big wings and then a central uh, gallery space. Um, there's two Louise Bourgeois spiders outside, the one that's freestanding on the lawn. We had a really significant collection of outdoor sculpture. And then there's a little spider on the wall and um, some Dale Chihuly pieces visible through the front doors there. And um, the reason this says 10 on it is because I was there for the 10 year anniversary, which was a, a big deal and we did a catalog and a lot of uh, promotion for that anniversary. There's my, that's my official um, portrait. Um, when you do get to be in a, a more senior position, um, you are kind of a, in the public eye a little bit more, so therefore is the, the need for a photograph like this. Um, being a, a museum director in a small museum, you have a, a variety of different jobs that you have to do. And, and um, sadly, in my case, hardly any of them had anything to do with my degree in art history. Um, I did work on special exhibitions and the collection, but my curators really did most of that day-to-day -day work. I did more of the uh, managing the staff and administrative work. Uh, special projects that I might create to keep myself interested over the years. Um, we also had, it, uh, the museum is a nonprofit, but we also had a four, two for-profit arms within the organization. One was a restaurant and one was a shop. And they were for-profit arms even under the nonprofit umbrella. Um, so that exists and those, those are things I didn't know anything about, but I had to learn. Um, you're also at a senior level kind of involved in fundraising or a lot involved in fundraising. 
Um, we also, during the, the 12 years that I was there, went from one building to three buildings. So I was involved in renovating old buildings and you guys are getting ready to, to get a new building. So that's pretty exciting. And you're, some of the senior people here on your staff and faculty will be involved in the same way. Um, and uh, we also had a very intense uh, educational component to our programming. So we were involved with lots, bringing lots of living artists in and doing public programming. So here are some pictures from all of those various things I just described. Um, this, is, this is our main gallery in, in the primary building, which is about 3,000 square feet, a really gorgeous space. Um, we would, as you do here down in the um, gallery in the art building, there are you know, temporary walls that can be brought in to sort of configure the space as you might want to for different projects, different exhibitions, um, and uh, beautiful blonde uh, wood floor and clear story windows. So it was just a beautiful space to work in. And here are a couple of installation shots with things from the permanent collection in the museum. And I should say that um, the museum was really founded by, um, it's named for the Kempers, Mr. and Mrs. Crosby Kemper, who built it um, using their own funds, contributed to uh, a lot of money to building it. And then they also contributed about 300 pieces of art to the permanent collection before the building even opened. And most of what you'll see is, is, uh, were gifts from them. So here is um, a Donald Sultan on the immediate left. Uh, behind that is Sean Scully. The standing sculpture is a bronze by Nancy Graves. Um, and then over on the right, you've got, um, I think, a Mark DeSouvero on the table. Uh, this is another different gallery, and you've got a Trenton Doyle Hancock uh, felt painting on the far left, Deborah Butterfield sculpture. Um, and on the floor is a work by a guy from Uruguay named Marco Maggi, and he uses reams of um, just printer or photocopier paper. Um, and he cut out pieces from the top sheet and sort of stood them up so they make like a shadow effect. Um, so it's kind of like a tiny little sculpture existing on top of all this paper. Um, so the collection is, was, is very um, varied. Um, so it contains contemporary art and also modern art as kind of a basis, which is great because the Kansas City Art Institute is right next door. And those students who are learning about contemporary art can also go across the street and see this modern collection, which is kind of the basis for today's contemporary work. But in the, in the more um, modern gallery, here's um, Dwayne Hansen, which is the, the figure, the man who's actually fiberglass. He's standing there. He's a car salesman. <laughs> uh, Andy Warhol over on the right, Hans Hoffman, Willem de Kooning, uh, Franz Klein over on the left, Fairford Porter, um, et cetera. And in this image, there's uh, Stephen Assail, William Christenberry installation on the right, and then the little sculpture on the floor is by Robert Chambers, and that's a bronze piece, and it's called a molecule dog. <laughs> uh, and then this piece is uh, by Damien Hurst, and it's a suite of prints that he made based on pharmaceutical labels, and they all have his name incorporated in them, like this first one, uh, omelet tablets, which he just made up, um, is by Hearst Damien. The other one, the next one is by Damien Hearst. And then that purple one says like, liver, bacon, and onions. I mean, he, there, so that's a really fun piece. If you know Hearst's work, this is probably one of the lighter ones. But we actually purchased this at auction and that was my, one of my jobs was to um, suggest acquisitions to our board, and in this case, actually go and bid on it uh, in a uh, Christie's auction in New York, which is really fun. <clears throat> it's fun when you get it, anyway, when you, when you get what you're bidding for. Um, so in terms of special exhibitions, we, did, we had a really rigorous exhibition schedule, probably about 30 exhibitions a year. Um, 
probably about four to five in our main gallery and then smaller ones in our small galleries. Um, this was a special exhibition by some uh, contemporary Chinese artists who are brothers. Their names are the Gao brothers. And um, as you can tell, these, are, these works are really monumental and it was a, it was a really big exhibition. Those are the artists on either side wearing white and their curator in the middle with the red on. Um, and this is another special exhibition with the artist Pita Coyne, who's in the black dress. And her work is on the wall behind us, and this was probably like opening night or something with some staff members. Um, this is a uh, work by Polly Applebaum, and uh, the Kemper is, has a long tradition of hosting contemporary artists and uh, mounting solo exhibitions of their work and then further supporting them by actually buying work out of the exhibition, usually a major piece for the collection. And it's, it's a really tremendous program and opportunity for visual artists. Um, and I don't know that there's another museum that really has that kind of tradition, but it's really great. And in this case, um, we commissioned Polly to make this piece. And it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but it is thousands and thousands of pieces of dyed velvet, um, hand dyed with like an eyedropper. Um, and so each piece has to be laid down physically, one on top of the other. And it was made for this space on the right. Um, so we then acquired it for our collection. And um, it was one of those pieces that was made for a certain space, but you could actually put it someplace else just kind of following her general rules for the installation. So the one on the left was another time when we had installed it in a, a different gallery. Um, this is also a painting that we purchased out of an exhibition and by Gajin, uh, Gajin Fujita. Uh, and this piece kind of incorporates some street art um, and uh, is, the artist is based in Los Angeles. This piece is called Ride or Die, and we purchased that out of the show. Really terrific painting. Um, other highlights from the collection um, include Georgia O'Keeffe's Yellow Jonquils. And uh, during the time that I was there, we were actually able to acquire two works by Ed Blackburn, which I'm really proud of. Um, this one is uh, Rodeo Rider. Um, and this is actually an early slide right after the, or an early picture soon after the painting was done. And then this is a, an image of it hanging in the atrium at the Kemper Museum. And what I loved about it being in this space was the, the black marble floors, which is a really unique architectural feature anyway. But when you um, installed it in that room with those floors, then you got that reflection on the floor and it was really beautiful, especially at night. And this is another of Ed Blackburn's paintings that we, inquire, that we acquired, uh, Cain and Abel. And this was when it had just arrived, so it was still in the crate, and it was the only, it's the only picture I could find of it. But uh, in the background is that Polly Applebaum exhibition. You can kind of see in there in the gallery. And here's another view of the outside of the building from a different vantage point, and you can see um, the Tom Otterness piece on the right, which is Crying Giant, actually looks a little bit like The Thinker, kind of funny. Um, and on the, on the right over there is, um, or on your left, I guess, is a big bronze piece by Jacques Lipschitz. Um, so the, um, the public art outdoor sculpture was a, another big component of our programming there. And this became really popular, um, kind of an icon for the city. This is on a Convention and Visitors Bureau magazine. And um, just while we were talking about the artist, artist Tom Otterness, who made that uh, crying giant, I wanted to show these pictures of a group of Kemper patrons going to his studio um, to visit with him, which we had the opportunity to do. And it, this is kind of a fundraising, friend-raising effort to take patron groups around and take them on to visit artist studios and go behind the scenes in various places and do trips. And um, it's very fun. And that is the artist Tom Otterness with the white hair showing a 
a component to one of his pieces. And his studio is amazing. Um, there's a big sort of caterpillar or something like that that he's working on in the background there. And a, another piece that works very playful, but real serious at the same time. And then um, this is actually uh, me with Tom's dealer, um, who was, uh, Tom is represented by Marlborough Gallery, which is one of the biggest and most prestigious galleries in New York. And um, Tom was actually having a show of his work, of his big bronzes outside in New York City at the same time. So it was an opportunity to see a lot of his work. And then um, back to the Kemper and our on-site uh, sculpture, this uh, is installation day for a piece by Jules Olitsky. Um, and it is made from a huge cement mixer. You know those things that are on the back of the cement truck going around? He cut that out from the mixer and then I think added some other things and made this beautiful orange sculpture which we acquired and put on the lawn of our uh, second building that we put together. Um, this, is, this was a commission for inside the building um, by Matthew Ritchie, who's also a New York-based um, artist. It's called Experience Time. And um, he actually um, made this piece kind of um, you know, using a computer program, and we just bought the rights to it. And then he actually fabricated it um, site-specifically for this space. Um, and it's made out of um, vinyl and another product called Centra, which is the, the vinyl is the black and the Centra is the color. And it basically just kind of sticks on to a prepared um, panel. And um, this was in uh, Cafe Sebastian, which is our restaurant inside the museum. And it was, it's a really a permanent piece, so it's there now if you wanted to see it. And this is a piece, uh, an image of it at night. Um, that's not actually it. It was an artist's rendering, so it looks slightly different. But that's how it looks at night, which is beautiful. And there's a lot of special events in that space as well. So it's kind of a multi-purpose space. And this is a Klaus Oldenburg work, not shown at the Kemper Museum, but shown in another location before we purchased it. But it's a, an artist, or a, a uh, architect's handkerchief. So like imagine the pocket of an architect with the handkerchief coming out. That's what that, that is. Very fun. And then um, special projects I mentioned to, uh, to keep the director from being bored. Um, we, had a, we had a corporate sponsor in, in downtown Kansas City, a company called DST Systems who, um, like us, desired to uh, bring more art to downtown Kansas City. So we partnered with them. They funded um, a couple of acquisitions. They gave us a budget. I think the budget was um, $500,000 to start. Um, and uh, we picked the art, and then we worked with them to cite it in various places in downtown Kansas City. This was the first project that we did with Luis Jimenez, and it's called Mestino, which is Spanish for Mustang, and it's uh, about a 10-foot high fiberglass Mustang, bright blue, and it has these red, um, tiny little red light bulbs for eyes, so they light up and glow in the dark at night, and it's a fabulous piece. Um, and just behind that, those four vertical elements, those are actually another piece of public art by R.M. Fisher. And it is on top of the Kansas City Convention Center, and it really kind of anchors the whole skyline of Kansas City. And everybody, everybody loves it. Every, like a lot of public art, everybody hated it at first, but then came to love it. And here's another picture of the piece. When we installed it, it was actually snowing that day, and then the paper was there. And this is um, the other, the second piece that we did with our corporate sponsor. And this is by Michael Reese, who's Kansas City and New York-based artist. And it has two components: uh, the sculptural component, which he calls a puto, um, 
and he calls it puto because he's kind of thinking of those little puti, like the little cherubs that float around in Rococo paintings. But his are, his are kind of more monsters because they're kind of impossible. But um, he, uh, it's a, a sculpture that he's made with variations uh, many times. And this is called two by, Puto 2x2x4 two by two by because it has like two sets of four appendages. Um, and then the video shows it, the video screen is huge, it's about 25 feet high, it's hard to tell here, but it's big. Um, the video that's constantly running alongside the sculpture shows this monster kind of dancing and twirling around, you know, if he could do that. But it's very fun. And the, the greatest thing about this piece is it's in a public space in downtown Kansas City. It's right across from a bus stop and across the street from the convention center. So a lot of out, you know, from out of town people will see it. And a lot of people coming to work every day on the bus will come across it and it becomes part of their daily life, which is really the, the great thing about public art. Um, and I brought a couple of other pictures related to this piece because it was about a two year project. And the first one, the, the Mustang, that budget we were able to adhere to to show that we could. This one got a little bit uh, more expensive, but that was okay because that, by that time they they were excited, excited to be working with us and they were able to throw in a little bit more money. Um, but this is a, a picture of the armature of the sculpture, which is steel. And then um, there's foam on the outside of it and it is sprayed finally to look like Corten steel with a permanent um, product that looks like steel. And here is the artist Michael Reese in his studio, which I was able to visit him while he was making it. And then um, this is a, a truck with a huge screen on it that we went to go visit because we were, about, we were investing a lot of money in this big screen that we were buying um, for, for the video there. Um, and it was the only time we could go see it was Thanksgiving weekend. It was freezing cold. We had to drive to North Dakota and nobody was working at the plant because it was Thanksgiving weekend. So they parked a screen outside on a truck so we could see it, um, so we could decide to spend a half a million dollars with them. Um, so that was kind of fun. Uh, it was a little field trip there. And then switching gears a little bit from art into um, what is not my favorite, was not my favorite part of the job, um, but it is a big part, reality is raising money is a big part of any arts related job at the senior level anyway. So you might love it and you might hate it, but it's, um, it's probably gonna raise its head. And this is uh, our membership brochure for the Kemper Museum. And uh, we had a donor who uh, paid for some new banners that went on the side of our building and this was something we put together to, to thank him. It was a little presentation because he wasn't able to come and see them but in person, but we wanted to thank him. Um, another part of my job was um, social media, promoting the museum. So every couple of weeks I would get drug over to the museum shop, one of our for-profit arms, uh, to, to do some Facebook promotions. So here I'm promoting this, uh, a couple of these bracelets made by an artist who, uh, whose work we sold in our shop. Um, this is another one of the uh, patron trips to exciting destinations and they are fun. And the patrons you know, pay a lot of money to go on these trips and um, we are generally, uh, the senior people are generally their hosts and guides. And now to the subject of um, what I would call advancement. Um, we had been in that first building that I showed you for um, a number of years and we had really run out of administrative space, space for the staff. So we were able to um, purchase this building um, about turn of the century, a Jacobean architectural uh, example in Kansas City, uh, we were able to purchase it. It was just a block away from the main uh, building. 
And we moved most of our uh, administrative staff into this building and there was also another exhibition space on the ground floor. But it took about three years to renovate it and um, cost, cost a lot, cost a lot more than we originally thought and that's just kind of the way those projects go. But this was a very big project. So this is before and this is after. Um, and it, it also gave us additional spaces for public art outside and in fact that Olitsky piece with the cement mixer that was outside here. And here's a couple of really horrifying pictures during the <laughs> renovation because um, it was really quite a job. Um, three stories plus a basement. Um, so the basement was where all of our uh, computer equipment went. Um, as a director, I'm also asked to make decisions about where the servers go and all of that. Um, so constantly learning and not yearly um, working so much with my art history degree, but it was a great experience. Um, so middle two stories were offices and then the top, which used to be a ballroom in this house, were also office space. And we were able to actually bring in a couple of uh, Kansas City artists to do commissions for the inside of the museum that were permanent. And this is the artist Ann Lindberg, um, whose work I really admire. And she, um, her work uh, is these little metal rods, like, I don't know how long they are. On the one end, there's a piece of wood that's a long, slender piece of wood painted white or gray or cream colored. Um, that's the sort of thicker part you see, and then she's putting the, the sharp end of the metal rod into the wall with a tool, and in the end you get this kind of, um, that's just like a small section, and I didn't really have a picture of the finished piece, but it looks like a huge um, field of flowing hay or a bird's wings or something like that when she's finished. It's a beautiful piece, and um, there's an air conditioning vent there that blows on it, so it sort of moves. and. It's a beautiful permanent piece. And then this is the um, second building, um, which we decided we needed more space, yet again, further down the road, for mainly for storage this time. And we also saw an opportunity to uh, be in the real core of our urban arts district, which is called the Crossroads. So we purchased this building. Um, and renovated it as well. This is a before picture, and this is an after uh, rendering, but it turned out beautifully. And a couple of shots of the work going on there, and the, the team of architects and builders and designers and installation team. And then um, lastly, on the subject of the Kemper, I brought this one um, piece to show you an example of the programming that we did, the <laughs> educational programming. This is a performance um, by a woman named Terry Frame, and it was about uh, 45 minutes long, very intensive. She has a mirror in front of her, and she basically builds this mask up on her face with clay, and it takes two or three, uh, it goes through two or three iterations. Like at one point she had these big rabbit ears like this, and then she messed those up, and then she made some horns, and it was really cool. And we also um, uh, put together a, a musical element, so there were a trio of musicians who had never worked together before, but they came together to write an original score to accompany um, her piece. And if I... <laughs> It was very neat. Um, okay, so that was uh, the Kemper Museum, and what am I doing now? Um, I, I had 12 years of working with a board of directors and at the Cantor Foundation, eight years of working with a board of directors, and I really was ready to be my own boss. And at this point, I felt like I had the skill set and also the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, to do that, and it was kind of scary to leave my regular paycheck, but I was able to do it. And my um, husband and I had uh, talked about this for quite some time, and my dream was that I wanted a space where I could have a 
private home gallery and do a number of things in it. And this is the building that we um, chose and ultimately were able to get. And there's my dog, Rocco, um, <laughs> at the gate. Um, but it's a, it's a great house um, for, for what we do in it. Um, and uh, there are really three things that are going on in the, in the house uh, right now. One of them is my business as a private dealer, and so I sell work privately, from, usually from one individual to another individual, sometimes to an institution too. But the house gives us an opportunity to show a, an exhibition of work if we want to, or just a single piece to a client that might be visiting. So it has big walls and it really serves this purpose quite well for us. This is a shot that I did primarily for marketing purposes. Um, and it's an Ed Blackburn painting on the back wall um, featuring Dean Martin and Inger Stevens based on a film still from uh, the movie called Five Card Stud. Uh, and this is um, uh, the dining room, which we use a lot for entertaining and also for meetings. And on the wall there is a painting by uh, Linda Blackburn called Hacienda. And here is another room in the house with uh, the polar bear is a formal portrait of a bear by uh, an artist named Jill Greenberg. And she actually went uh, outside in Canada and took these formal portraits of bears um, and then on the Next to it is a painting by Linda Blackburn, and further to the right is a painting by uh, Vernon Fisher, who you might know as well, since he taught here for uh, quite some time. Um, the second thing we're doing in the house is an appraisal business. I don't have pictures of doing appraising because it's pretty, it's private. Um, an appraisal is a quasi-legal document that you use to value an item, usually fine art, but also we do wine and we do a number of different things, but we focus on fine art. Um, and an appraisal can be done for client information, just how much is this worth, I might want to sell it, or I just want to know. Appraisals can be done for insurance scheduling or for insurance loss. Um, appraisals can be done for equitable distribution in the case of an estate, a state tax, or a divorce. Um, they're done for a number of reasons. Um, you have to be certified by an organization such as Appraiser Association of America to do them, but it's kind of our bread and butter. It's what we do um, all day long, every day. And when I say we, I have a full-time assistant um, who works with me now and has been with me for four years. Um, the third thing that we're doing out of the house is the George Caleb Bingham catalog raisonné, and George Caleb Bingham is a uh, 19th century American artist from Missouri. He's often referred to as the painter of Missouri, and his catalog raisonné, in case you don't know what that is, it's, a, uh, it's the definitive reference book on an artist's work. So ideally it contains every painting that the artist ever did. Now Bingham didn't sign his work hardly at all, um, so since the first catalog raisonné was done, 30 more paintings have been identified as being by him, so it needs to be updated. Um, I work with his paintings quite a lot because he is Missouri-centric and I live in Missouri. Um, these are three of his paintings. Um, the two on either side of the mantle are, were sold, one to an individual, individual collector and one to a museum. Um, and uh, you probably know his work, if the name doesn't ring a bell, you probably know his work from his uh, paintings titled The Jolly Flat Boatmen, which were paintings of river barges uh, on the Mississippi River with uh, workers kind of dancing on top of the, the barge. Um, this is kind of our little uh, poster boy for the project. Um, and he's kind of uh, looks a little bit like uh, Tom Sawyer, but he's, it was actually painted about 30 years before Tom Sawyer was written. And then lastly, I just brought some slides of things that I have sold recently um, because I am able to work pretty broadly. So I sell contemporary work, um, modern American paintings, 
and also 19th and 20th century American paintings too. So that's kind of a span of about 150 years. This is a painting by Joe Ando, who's a Texas artist, and it's, this is a really big painting of a horse. Um, this is a photograph by Andy Goldsworthy, who's British, and he's an <laughs> earthworks artist, and that yellow line that you see is actually a line of um, some kind of yellow flower that he wrapped around those rocks in order to make a, a perfect line, and then he photographed it, and that's what he does. This is a work in porcelain called 44, Mandela, 44 Magnum Mandela. Um, this is a work by a Kansas City artist who's a strong feminist and she's really anti-gun, uh, has a strong anti-gun stance, but her work is about how our society looks, kind of glorifies guns. Um, this is a ceramic uh, called a pillow pitcher by the artist Betty Woodman, and she uses a pillow actually to structure her uh, clay around. Rachel, we're at time. Oh, okay. Uh, this we've got like three more. Oh, yeah. This is a bronze piece, 50 inches wide. It was an outdoor piece. Uh, social realist painter Raphael Sawyer, Thomas Hart Benton watercolor, American art by William Merritt Chase and Alfred Maurer. And then the last piece I sold was a 48 inch uh, spin painting by Damien Hurst. And the last thing I'll say is the best part of my job is getting to live with all of this art um, before I sell it. So 